Good morning everyone, welcome to our Sunday morning service on the 31st of October. Uh, it's good to have you with us uh, on this day as we gather and worship from different places, different situations, different contexts, as we are people of different ages, different nationalities, different backgrounds, but we're united in that we gather to worship our Lord and Saviour. So welcome. I invite you now with me to keep some moments of silence to help us focus afresh upon the living God. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As we come now to our opening song, we sing together. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. And so at the beginning of our worship we also come to prayers of penitence. And so now let us confess to God the sins and shortcomings of the world, its pride, its selfishness, its greed, its evil distortions and hatreds. Let us confess our share in what is wrong and our failure to seek and establish that peace which God wills for all his children. Let's be still and reflect.
We pray together. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew our right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by his Spirit and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our heart dance for joy, and in our song will we praise our God. Blessed are you, Lord God, creator of heaven and earth. Your word calls all things into being, and the light of dawn awakens us to life. May your wisdom guide us this day, that we may cherish and care for your good creation and offer to you the sacrifice of our lips, praising you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. The night is past, and the day and the week lies open before us, so let us now bring that day and that week before the Lord. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. And so we now come to Scripture and we listen to Psalm uh, 34, listening to a word or phrase the Lord seeks to bring to our attention. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, and listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. As we continue to listen to the Bible, we now listen to Ephesians chapter 6, read by Reuben. The reading comes from Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and the shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. 
To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And so now we come to our Gospel reading from Matthew chapter 7, the closing words of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount, beginning at verse 15 to the end. Jesus said, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognise them. 
Do pe people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognise them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds beat and blew against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And so we hear the Gospel Canticle, the Te Deum. We praise you, O God. We acclaim you as the Lord. All creation worships you, the Father everlasting. To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, the cherubim and seraphim sing in endless praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of prophets praise you. The white-robed army of martyrs praise you. Throughout the church, throughout the world, the Holy Church acclaims you. Father of majesty unbounded, your true and only Son, worthy of all praise, the Holy Spirit, advocate and guide. You, Christ, are the King of glory, the eternal Son of the Father. When you took our flesh to set us free, you humbly chose the virgin's womb. You overcame the sting of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You are seated at God's right hand in glory, and we believe that you will come and be our judge. Come then, Lord, and help your people, bought with the price of your own blood, and bring us with your saints to glory everlasting. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And so as we come to the message, let's pray at the start of it. Father, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit afresh to teach each of us this day. As we dive into the Bible, would you awaken our hearts, expand our minds and shape our identities and lives today? We want to live a Jesus-shaped life. Amen. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. This is an amazing image that Jesus gives us at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. 
It's well known to many of us. We may remember it very much from Sunday school, or perhaps a song is running around our heads of a children's song we learned which explained it or told us about it. It's a powerful image that Jesus uses as he comes to the close of his sermon. He says, really looking back at all that he said, chapters 5, 6, 7, but all that he will say in his teaching, he says it is possible to hear what he says and do what he said. And it's important that we do. But when we think of that idea of hearing and doing what Jesus says, is that sound like a dream to us? Something not possible, really? Or do we have another attitude? Perhaps have we in somehow embraced a form of consumer Christianity that says that all out engagement with Jesus is seen as just one option that can be taken if people want it. It's something we can fit in or choose to do, a bit like priests and missionaries and monks and holy people do, or perhaps something young people do, or something we used to do, but then life got very complicated. How do we respond to what Jesus is saying at the end of his Sermon on the Mount? When we think about all that Jesus has been saying, it's a good life. It's a beautiful life, Jesus has been describing. The life on the rock is a good way to live. Wouldn't you want to be a person who knows how to live a rich and unshakable life as storms crash and bang? Someone who is free from loneliness, fear, anxiety, and filled with peace and joy? Would you like to love your neighbours as you do yourself and be free of envy and greed and lust and vengeful anger? Would you like to have no need for others to praise you? And would you like not to be paralysed or humiliated by their dislike or even condemnation? I mean, all this sounds pretty good so far. But as we hear that list I've just said, or perhaps again as we've gone through Sermon on the Mount, we may have a mixture of feelings. There may be a big yes within us that says, I want this, I want that. This all sounds like the abundance of life which Jesus seems to have lived, a life he promised in John 10. But other parts of what I said or other parts of his teaching may sound like obedience, a choice to do what we would otherwise choose differently, a choice which may spoil our plans. So a question can be, do I really want to give up all the options? that would disappear from my toolbox if I become the person described, the wise person who builds his or her house on the rock. The truth is that obedience to Jesus is about abundance, a greater life, a beautiful life. That is what Jesus has been introducing us to in these words in Matthew, a Jesus-shaped life. And Jesus believes that we can grow in Christ's likeness in this life, not simply in the life to come. A question to ask ourselves is, we who have committed our lives to King Jesus, how would we train ourselves to learn from Jesus? How to teach ourselves to live our life as he would live it if he were us? Think of how we learned to ride a bike or to swim. We teach our kids to, to ride a bicycle or to swim, and they occasionally, usually do ride a bike or swim on appropriate occasions. We teach them to do it. We, don't, we do not teach them that they ought to, read, to ride bicycles and leave it like that. We do not teach them that it is good to ride bicycles and leave it like that. Or that they should be ashamed to ride bicycles. Ashamed that if they don't read, ride, read bicycles. So there's something about here teaching ourselves and others to do what Jesus teaches. To teach ourselves to bless those who curse us. And actually, we do bless those who curse us even when it comes from those close to us. 
Imagine you're driving by a church that has a large sign in front which says, We teach all who seriously commit themselves to Jesus how to do everything he said to do. Now, you may well think, of course, that is what Jesus, the founder of the church, told us to do. But your second thought in the car may be, can that be right? Can a church do that? That's so arrogant for a church to claim they can do that. No one can do that. Can it be real? So how can we progress in hearing and doing? So it is not ought. It's not ashamed if you don't. It isn't even as good to. How can we be taught to ride the bike? Well, first of all, this is not about more information. When we're thinking of teaching, this is not about communicating or collecting information. Our challenge, for each of us to be honest, is usually not about informing a disciple about things that Jesus believed, taught or practiced. Usually that has been already done. We, students of Jesus, already hold almost all of the correct information. Don't get me wrong. Information on what Jesus believed, taught and practiced and the rest of scriptural teachings is essential. By such information, students have confidence in Jesus. Yet, while that is important, there is a risk that the information we may have does not form part of our real day-to-day -day life. In our bodily actions, our thought patterns and social lives, we continue to be ready to live and act as though it were not true, even if we verbally affirm it or accept it. So what Jesus is pointing us to is this is not about getting the right answers. This is about getting the right answers and believing them, as Dallas Willard says. Jesus is asking of us to come to a point where we actually believe all the things we have actually heard. The task is to transform our right answers into automatic responses to day-to-day -day situations. This is when we think about it, what Paul has been teaching in the armour of God. We take up the armour by believing what we've heard. So we need to ask ourselves, is there a chance that we are unable to believe our theology? That we are unable to believe it in the same way that we genuinely do believe many other things in our real life? To believe something is to act as if it is so. For example, to believe that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is to act, behave accordingly when trying to find out how many euros we have in the house or how many apples. The advantage of believing it is not that we can pass tests in mathematics. It is that that we can deal much more successfully with reality in life. There's an audiobook that I'm listening to at the moment, which is about American forces serving in Afghanistan, particularly in Nuristan in the east of the country and describes how they were working closely with Afghan forces. Those Afghan forces were paid, yet the money which kept being transported to them was always short. The soldiers never understood what they were meant to receive or how much. They just believed what their commander said. So an American officer decided to teach these Afghan soldiers how to count and to do basic maths. So they understood how much they were meant to get and they knew when they would not get it in their hand. They believed 2 plus 2 equaled 4, and it helped them to live. The advantage of believing, for example, in the death of Jesus is that we then live as if the death of Jesus is real and did what it says it did. We put our feet on the rock, as Jesus says, then build on sand. For some of us, our next step as disciples, I believe, is not about getting more information. It is about you and I believing with our whole being the information we already have as a Christian. A couple of small suggestions how this can look like. We call them smell the roses. C.S. Lewis, uh, the great writer, talked about books, how they should take you on a journey 
up and down across the hills and around and become part of you and simply instead of simply taking you from A to B book done. His vision is we spend time with the book and so his idea is something about letting our information about faith soak inside us. We chew over it, we listen to the podcast, we read the book again. And this may mean a change or a challenge to our habits because social media may have changed us. I mean, we know how it is, how we use our phones usually. Wait for a bus, we're on the toilet or during the middle of a meal. We look down at the screen and we scroll through a flow of social media, cat videos, advertisements, Star Wars memes and selfies. It all flicks by a furious pace, seemingly with no purpose or afterthought from us. But can our faith information become like that? We're flicking from thing to thing to thing and it never actually lands with us, never has an afterthought. The song, the podcast, the Bible reading, always speed, no opportunity to soak. Or what we simply do is that we run with the latest thought that we read or saw a few minutes before. And then 10 minutes later, another thought and so on and so forth. We have to be mindful of how we are engaging with the Christian information we have. And secondly, of course, remember that what occupies our mind often governs what we do. It sets the emotions out of which our actions flow. It becomes a compass pointing the way for possible ways of action. So we seek that our mind becomes increasingly directed towards God. There is a saying, take time to smell the roses. It means to enjoy the rose you have, to focus upon it, to bring the rose fully before our senses and mind as possible. To smell a rose means you have to get close. You have to take time. And when you do so, you delight in it. You love it. To take time to smell the roses can leave lasting impressions. If we are simply to love God, and have our life filled with that love, to stand on that foundation, Jesus, in all his glorious reality, must be brought into our minds and kept there in such a way that it takes root and stays fixed there. It may be the reality and beauty of what he is saying, such in the words we've been looking at, or simply the fact that he cares to have opinions about those things. This is about taking time regularly within your weekday, not just on a Sunday, to bring the reality of Jesus into our minds and his words and the beauty of what he is asking, asking before us. To smell the roses. We are all disciples. To become a disciple of Jesus, a person must believe in him. In order to de develop, to grow as a disciple, one must increasingly, progressively come to believe what he, Jesus, knew to be true. To enter his kingdom, we believe in him. To be at home in his kingdom, to have that increasingly Jesus-shaped life, we must share his beliefs. Hence, his story. Two men, two houses, two foundations, two results, two responses to Jesus. The houses. Two men, two houses. Both a wise man, and the foolish man built a house. They both planned to live in it. It was to be of long-lasting significance to them. Our lives are like those houses. We look at the long term. This is about how we are living for the rest of our lives. The houses looked very different, didn't look very different from the outside. They all looked sim the, the both houses looked the same. And at this stage, looking from the outside, no one could have told them apart. Similarly, two lives can look very similar. Superficially, they may be the same, but the difference will be evident when the challenge comes. In both cases, in both lives, both houses, the rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house. All of us, sooner or later, Jesus says, will face the pressures of life. The challenges come in many ways. Misunderstandings, unfulfilled longings, disappointments, 
doubts, trials, temptations, satanic attacks, the day of evil as Paul describes. Success can be a test too. We can face the challenges of pressure, setback, suffering, sickness, bereavement, trauma, tragedy, persecution, failure, virus, pandemic. But Jesus says indirectly, we do not need to live in fear, though the storm is real and strong and loud. It is not easy, but there's a way, Jesus says, to be sure that when the foundations of our houses are shaken and tested, that they stand the test. It is possible to know that the future is ultimately secure. Two foundations. The difference between two houses, it is the foundations. It is not clear if Jesus speaks about a difference in location or in depth. The wise man goes on looking until he finds rock on which to build. The foolish man chooses an attractive piece of sand, not realizing it is a dry wadi, which in a winter rain, which with winter rains will become a raging river. Or it could be that the foolish man builds on the sand, but the wise man digs down until he finds the rock underneath. Jesus' teachings, he says, are to be foundational. You know, when I became a Christian, before that date in September 1993, you would probably have said that I looked like a Christian before that. I was baptised, I was confirmed, I went to church, my parents were Christians. Yet, you know, looking back, when the pressure came, as I faced important exams which would determine if I could go to university or not, you know, I had nothing to rely on. All that knowledge that I had from being brought up in the church, it was sand, head, head only. Now later, having become a Christian at university, when facing stress and challenges, and I still can get stressed, you just need to ask my family, but now I know the one I'm trying to lean on, have my foundation upon. When I became a Christian, I began to learn the difference between having Jesus' teachings as foundational instead of nice, interesting ideas that I could quote. Two results. Because the foundations of the houses were so different, the results are equally different. As we heard Jesus say, the rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But about the house in the sand, it fell with a great crash. This again is not Jesus threatening people. He loves us and so he warns us. Over 30 years ago, on Wednesday, 13th of March, 1991, there was a terrible accident on the UK M4 motorway, which involved 51 vehicles. 10 people died and 25 people were injured on a foggy day in what was one of Britain's worst road accidents. One man, Alan Bateman, was hailed as a hero. After he climbed out of his damaged car, he ran along the central reservation to try and warn oncoming vehicles of the wreckage ahead. Some drivers sounded their horns at him and however drove on and regretfully hit the cr uh, find the crash vehicles. Jesus warns us not in order to frighten us, but because he loves us and wants us to avoid the crash. He wants us to be like the wise man whose house did not fall, but stood the test. The amazing promise Jesus gives is that a house built on the rock, who hear and put into practice, who truly believe what he says, will be a house which withstands the storms of life. As Nicky Gumbel says, a life founded on obedience to Jesus is safe, no matter what the storms of life may bring. And the 19th century American evangelist D.L. Moody wrote in his Bible alongside these verses from Matthew, Build on the rock and fear no shock. And so, responses to Jesus. Jesus has pointed clearly to the key difference, which is where we began this sermon. The wise man not only hears the words of Jesus, but puts them into practice. The foolish man, he hears them, but he does not. To be clear in case of confusion, Jesus is not saying that we earn our way into the kingdom of God by our good works. That would be clearly against his teaching and the teaching across the rest of the New Testament. 
Secondly, note that Jesus is not saying that the person who puts his words into practice will lead a sinless life. John reminds us, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And as Paul reminds us in Galatians 5, our sinful nature is waging against the desires of the Holy Spirit within us. Jesus is simply teaching what we see repeated across the New Testament. Listening is not enough. Hearing leads to action. So to conclude this message and to conclude our series, Jesus has been describing the Jesus-shaped life. He knows that we have an enemy who will seek to lead us astray. He knows we also have the resources of the kingdom, the Holy Spirit available to strengthen us and help us. A Jesus-shaped life is about, as we have seen, being a child of God, living a life of blessing, being peacemakers, pure in heart, having the fullness of life, living in right relationship with God and with each other. A Jesus-shaped life will be seen in how we live as salt of the earth and bright lights in a dark world. It will be seen in our righteous lives. Instead of nursing anger against people and seeking revenge, we seek reconciliation. In following his radical teaching on faithfulness in relationships, not being a slave to sexual desire, but upholding sanctity in marriage. It will be seen in complete integrity, going the extra mile, loving our enemies, even those who persecute us and being part of God's plan to redeem and transform the world. It will be made evident by our secret life of giving generously, being a loving community who prays, and not consumed by unforgiveness, but forgiving one another, loving each other, even if we cannot see that person as a friend. It will show itself in the fact that we store up treasures in heaven and not on earth, not being dominated by worries and fears or obsessed by money, but seeking and keeping on seeking God's kingdom. A Jesus-shaped life will be revealed in our relationships that we are not judgmental about others, but instead we seek God with all our heart and mind, and we pray for others, not condemning them or throwing our wisdom towards them. We do to others what we would have them do to us. And finally, a Jesus-shaped life will show itself in our commitment to enter through the narrow gate, his gate, and to build our lives upon the rock, him and his teaching. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, today again, I fix my eyes on you, the author and perfecter of my story. Today I choose and desire that I would believe your words and that they would shape how I live. Give me the help of your Holy Spirit again. Help me to resist the temptations of in one ear, out the other. Help me to know you more clearly, love you more dearly and follow you more nearly each and every day. I want to live the beautiful life, the Jesus-shaped life you offer us. Amen. Peace.
now let us affirm our faith where we are in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And so Mark now leads us in intercessions. Let's pray. United in the company of all the faithful and looking for the coming of the kingdom, let us offer our prayers to God, the source of all life and holiness. Merciful Lord, strengthen all Christian people by your Holy Spirit, that we may live as a royal priesthood and a holy nation to the praise of Jesus Christ our Saviour. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless Robert and David, our bishops, our chaplain Grant, and all ministers of your church, that by faithful proclamation of your word, we may be built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets into a holy temple in the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Empower us by the gift of your holy and life-giving spirit, that we may be transformed into the likeness of Christ from glory to glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Protect those who are oppressed because of their faith in you. Provide them with all the blessings they need, in particular access to your written word and safe places to meet and worship together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless the people of your first covenant, Israel, chosen by you above all the nations. Protect them in the land of their inheritance and hasten to fulfill all the good you promised them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give to the world and its peoples the peace that comes from above, that they may find Christ's way of freedom and life. Give wisdom to our government in how to deal with the increasing number of COVID infections and guide the formation of a new cabinet, that we may be blessed with leaders that seek your will and serve this country accordingly. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless the 26th conference of the parties in Glasgow starting today, that those in positions of power may take the right decisions, sharing with those in need, caring for the vulnerable and acting as good stewards to your creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hold in your embrace all who witness to your love in the service of the poor and needy, all who minister to the sick and dying, and all who bring light to those in darkness, remembering before you especially Jorin and her work in Lebanon. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Touch and heal all those whose lives are scarred by sin or disfigured by pain, that, raised from death to life in Christ, their sorrow may be turned to eternal joy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Strengthen us in all spiritual battles, especially today when the world celebrates Halloween. Shield us as congregation and this city and all who live in it from everything occult. Protect particularly our children and young adults, and lead those who are drawn to the darkness into your light and salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Remember in your mercy all those gone before us who have been well-pleasing to you from eternity. Preserve in your faith your servants on earth, guide us to your kingdom, and grant us your peace at all times. Lord. In your mercy, 
hear our prayer. Haste in the day when many will come from east and west, from north and south, and sit at the table in your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks for the whole company of your saints in glory, with whom in fellowship we join our prayers and praises. By your grace may we, like them, be made perfect in your love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so our closing prayers. Faithful God, receive all our monies, our time, our gifts, our lives. We offer you this day. May we so live the life of Christ that your church may be a sign of salvation to all the nations of the world. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. O gracious and holy Father, give us wisdom to perceive you, intelligence to understand you, diligence to seek you, patience to wait for you, eyes to see you, a heart to meditate on you, and a life to proclaim you, through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Glorious God, the whole creation proclaims your marvellous work, increase in us a capacity to wonder and delight in it, that heaven's praise may echo in our hearts and our lives be spent as good stewards of the earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so we pray as our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Uh, about our church life here at All Saints. Uh, two, two notices bring your attention to. Uh, tomorrow is November 1st, uh, All Saints Day, and so we will be having a service on All Saints Day at Cosmic, our regular home at 7.30pm. Uh, uh, it's an important day to celebrate in, in the church year. It's also the start of Kingdom season, and so we invite you to join us in that live service at uh, 7.30 on tomorrow. And secondly, uh, next Sunday, November 7th, is what you could say Vision Sunday in terms of looking ahead as a church the coming months and certain things we want to focus upon and encourage. So we'll be communicating that within uh, the preaching and, and teaching next Sunday, the 7th of November. So let's sing together our closing song of worship.
So wherever we are, let's receive God's blessing now. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look kindly upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and forevermore. Amen. Let's pray our closing prayer together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen.